So this video has been requested several times and I figured I'd finally get around to doing it. Just as a disclaimer before I start, there's no way that I can practically go over all of the methods in this video, otherwise it'll be a thousand minutes long, but I'm going to cover it in the introduction so we can go over it more in theory. The practical aspect for this video will be a basic recrystallization and maybe in the future I'll go over some more complicated ones practically. Anyway, with that disclaimer, we can move on and start the introduction. The first thing I'm going to address is what is a recrystallization and why do we do it? Both of these questions can be answered in one sentence and that's a recrystallization is a useful technique to purify a chemical. Okay, so that's really general and we're going to have to elaborate a little bit more on that. The basic premise is that we take a compound that's impure, we dissolve it in a solvent when it's hot, which will dissolve both the compound and the impurity, but as the solvent cools down, our actual compound will precipitate out and form crystals, whereas our impurity will stay dissolved in the solvent. Our product precipitates out because its solubility decreases as the solvent cools down. These crystals, in theory, if allowed to form slowly and nicely, should be very pure. So what I described was the very basic premise of recrystallization, and now I'll get into the little nuances. So sometimes I said the impurities will dissolve in the solvent, but sometimes this isn't the case and the impurities 100% completely do not dissolve in the solvent. This is also okay as long as our compound totally dissolves, because this means that all of the impurities are left behind. However, if we just continue with the recrystallization and we let our crystals form, they'll just be mixed in with the undissolved impurities. So in this case, what needs to be done is what's known as a hot filtration. What is done is basically just as the technique says, and the solution is filtered while hot. Because we need to keep everything super hot, the apparatus that we filter it through also has to be warmed up. I won't get into all the details now, but basically we pass the hot solvent through a filter which collects all the impurities. Then our clean solvent, free of insoluble impurities, is collected and allowed to recrystallize as normal. So maybe you can see that this is just a recrystallization with an added step and it's not too complicated. So the common theme between these two methods of recrystallization is that they both use a single solvent but the more complicated version is when we use a multi-solvent system. We use multi-solvent systems when we can't get a single solvent to satisfy our requirements. Our basic requirement is that our compound is very soluble in hot solvent, but not very soluble in cold solvent, but the impurity is soluble in cold and hot. The method involving a solvent mixture can be done in two main ways. The first method is we have a constant proportion of solvent A mixed with solvent B, and we carry out the recrystallization as normal. Normal meaning we do the exact same thing as we would if we used just a single solvent. Which means we dissolve the compound of interest, we heat it up, and then we let it cool and have crystals form. The second method is a little harder, and this involves dissolving everything in solvent A and slowly adding solvent B. Usually our compound of interest is insoluble in solvent B, so as more is added, the solubility of our compound of interest decreases in the solution. This, however, doesn't have the same effect on the impurity, which will just remain dissolved regardless. This technique can be done with or without heating, and I actually demonstrate it in my lidocaine video. So in that example, I fully dissolved my lidocaine in ethanol, and I slowly added water. Lidocaine is extremely insoluble in water, so as it's added to the ethanol, its solubility in that solution will slowly decrease. If done very slowly, this can have the same effect as decreasing temperature because we're effectively doing the same thing and just slowly reducing the solubility. With this slow, gradual decrease in solubility, our product, in my case lidocaine, should precipitate out and form crystals. This technique takes some patience and I went a little bit too fast with my lidocaine and it kind of crashed out instead of slowly precipitating, but I was still able to get pretty nice crystals. In the case of my lidocaine, I did this at room temperature, but there are some cases where it can be done at boiling temperatures. When it's done hot, it's usually because the solubility at room temperature isn't good enough to dissolve everything in a reasonable amount of solvent. 
The technique is pretty much the same though, and everything's dissolved in very hot solvent A. Then solvent B is added very slowly and dropwise until we see just a little bit of our compound of interest precipitate out. We then add a little bit of hot solvent A to redissolve everything and get it back into solution, and then we take it off heat and let it recrystallize as normal. The last technique that I didn't think I'd go over but decided that I will is a technique that you probably will not carry out, especially if you're doing chemistry at home. This technique involves dissolving your compound of interest in a mixed solvent system, but then selectively pulling off one of the solvents with a lower boiling point under vacuum. So for example, let's say we use lidocaine and we dissolve it in an ethanol water mixture. As I said before, it's really insoluble in water and it's really only staying dissolved because there's ethanol present. However, ethanol has a lower boiling point than water and a higher vapor pressure, which means that if we pull a vacuum on it, the ethanol is going to leave first. So if we do pull a vacuum on it, we can slowly remove the ethanol and decrease the solubility of the lidocaine in the solvent mixture. When we do this, the lidocaine will slowly precipitate out of the solution and form crystals. So our lidocaine forms these nice crystals and our impurity, which is ideally water soluble, stays dissolved. So this is a really long-winded introduction, but I wanted to cover as much as I could. The major thing that you should remember about recrystallization is that it's basically just a manipulation of solubility. We're using temperature or solvent proportions to manipulate the solubility and slowly precipitate out our product while keeping impurities dissolved. It's a pretty basic technique and it's extremely useful in many applications. However, it does have a downside though, and because we're relying on the manipulation of solubilities, what happens if our impurity has an extremely similar solubility to our desired product? I'm not really going to cover this in this video, but the basic answer is we're screwed. What we have to do at that point is move on entirely to a totally different technique, which is known as chromatography. Chromatography isn't one technique, and it's a huge array of techniques which are based on the same principle. In all chromatography, we have what's known as a mobile phase and a stationary phase. Our products move with the mobile phase and they pass over the stationary phase. Even products that have very similar solubilities will have different molecular properties. As the products travel through the stationary phase, they'll stick and unstick to the stationary phase at different rates. The ones that stick more often and more tightly are going to lag behind. Even though it lags behind, it's still going to pass through the whole system, but we're going to have a separation between the products now, and we can selectively collect them. Anyway, that's not really a topic for this video, and we already have an over 8 minute introduction, so I'm going to get things started. For this video, I'll be recrystallizing urea that I got from two instant cold packs. In America, these are very common and easy to find. Some cold packs though do use things like ammonium nitrate, so always be sure to read the ingredients. Like ammonium nitrate, urea is used because when it dissolves into water, it cools down. I start out by pouring the contents of two cold packs into a beaker. To do this, the cold packs cut open and a small bag containing water is removed, and then everything else is poured into the beaker. Once this is done, we're left with a nearly half full beaker of urea pellets. The next step to take is to add the solvent that we want to recrystallize it in. The solvent choice when carrying out a recrystallization is extremely important. The ideal solvent that's used is one that the product isn't soluble in it when the solvent is cold, but it's very soluble when the solvent is hot. Then at the same time, the impurity has to be soluble at all temperatures. This is often hard to find and it usually takes some research and playing around. By playing around, I mean the very annoying process of determining the solubility of the compound in various solvents when they're hot and when they're cold. The big problem with solvents is that the product is usually way too soluble or not soluble enough. If a very small amount of solvent is used, it will be very concentrated and crystals won't form very well. However, if it's not soluble enough, we probably won't have the concentration high enough to produce many crystals and a lot of the product will probably remain dissolved in the solvent. However, luckily, most products have been already recrystallized, and if you search online, you can probably find the ideal solvent. 
Online, I found that about one gram of urea dissolves in about one milliliter of boiling 95% ethanol. So given that I have 250 grams, I started out by adding 200 milliliters of 95% ethanol. I don't want to add 250 milliliters of ethanol right away because I don't want to have the risk of adding too much. It's better to add less first and then add more slowly until we get to the perfect point that everything is dissolved. So we turn on the hot plate, but on the side, we also add some ethanol in a beaker so we can heat that up as well. To keep the temperature from dropping when we add more solvent, we have to add boiling hot ethanol. As you can see here, the urea solution's boiling and not even close to all of it is dissolved. So what we can do now is we can start adding some hot ethanol to it. I was a little slack and the ethanol that I added wasn't quite at boiling, but this is okay as long as I wait until my urea solution boils before adding more. So I keep doing this and adding more ethanol and replenishing my ethanol stock when it runs low. Eventually though, the level of the solvent starts to get dangerously close to the top of the beaker, so unfortunately it's time to change up to a larger one. This happens quite often when you don't know exactly how much solvent you're going to need, and it's not really a huge deal, but you'll probably lose a little bit when you transfer it. So while it's still hot and boiling, I transfer it to a larger beaker. Be careful when transferring hot liquids like this for obvious reasons. Ethanol's boiling point is only around 80 C, so I was able to do this with my bare hands. Once it's transferred to the beaker, a little bit more ethanol was added, and you can see it's starting to get quite a bit clearer. Unfortunately, my footage for this is a little bit lacking, but eventually it'll reach a point where everything clears up. It'll reach a point where pretty much everything's dissolved, and I'll use a squirt bottle just to add a little bit more ethanol. Once it's at this point and we're satisfied that everything's dissolved, we're finished with this portion of the recrystallization. I turn off the hot plate, I take out my glass stir rod, and I remove my stir bar. The next step was to place the beaker on the table and to let it cool slowly to room temperature. It's very, very important that we cool it as slowly as possible to allow crystals to form. If it's cooled too quickly, we'll simply crash the urea out of solution and it will trap impurities with it. After letting it cool for a little bit, some crystals will start to form. As the solution slowly cools, the solubility of urea will slowly decrease. As this happens, urea will slowly precipitate out of solution and will form crystals. At first it's slow, but as time goes on, more and more crystals will appear. Crystals will also form at the top of the liquid because it's losing heat to the air and cooling down faster than the rest of the liquid. I think it's pretty cool and mesmerizing to watch the crystals floating around in the solution. After a while, a big piece of the crystals that had formed at the top fell to the bottom. When I come back a little while later, I see that there's a lot more crystals and it's slowly clouding over. Eventually, so many crystals had formed that it became completely white. After it had completely cooled down to room temperature, it had pretty much solidified. To further precipitate everything, it was placed in the freezer, and now we have our completely recrystallized solution. So using a metal spatula, I break up the cake inside of the beaker. By stirring around for about 30 seconds, I'm able to break it up so it's more like a slush or a slurry. Once this is done and I've stirred it around a bunch, we're ready to proceed on to the next step, which is filtration. I opted to use vacuum filtration, but of course gravity filtration is perfectly acceptable as well. So I start out by dumping in as much as my filter will hold. I then pull the vacuum to get rid of the ethanol. 
Once all the ethanol is gone, I can add more stuff to filter. After pulling the vacuum though this time, you can see that the filter is pretty full to the top with solid. So unfortunately, there was too much to do it in one run, and I'm going to have to carry out two separate filtration steps. Before taking it out though, we have to wash it with a little bit of ice cold ethanol. It's important to wash it a few times to get rid of the recrystallization solvent, which contains impurities. Each time after the ethanol is added, using a metal spatula, it's thoroughly mixed to make sure that all of the crystals are washed. So I decided to wash it a total of two times, and after this, I pulled a vacuum on it to try to get out as much ethanol as possible. By keeping the vacuum on for a few minutes, we can actually get the crystals pretty dry. Once the crystals were relatively dry, I transfer them to a white piece of paper. I then continue with the filtration process by filtering out the second half of the crystals. I follow the exact same procedure as before, I put it in the filter, remove the recrystallization solvent, and then I wash the crystals twice. The only difference in this part is that I had to wash the beaker a few times to get out any crystals that might remain, and add this to the filter as well. So after drying it under vacuum for a few minutes, I add it to the batch we had before. So after adding it to this, we're left with a large batch of crystals which are slightly wet with ethanol. To get rid of the ethanol, it's very simple and we just have to leave it out to dry in air. To dry it, I spread all the crystals out in a small container. After leaving it out for just one night, the crystals were pretty much dry. I transferred some to a small watch glass so you can see the texture of the crystals easier. You can see here that we're left with some nice clean urea crystals and I'm very happy with the results. One important thing to note is that no matter how good your recrystallization technique is, you will always lose some product in the solvent. It's not uncommon to lose up to 5 or 10% of your product. One thing I didn't cover though was the possibility that your product won't crystallize as the solution cools down. This can happen if your glass is too smooth and there's no surface for the crystal to grow on. If this happens, the best thing to do to initiate crystallization is to use a glass stir rod and scrape the bottom. This etches the surface of the beaker and breaks off little pieces of glass that the crystals can grow on. So that's all I have to say about recrystallization and I hope you guys enjoyed. I might explore in future videos some of the techniques that I mentioned in the introduction, but I can't guarantee anything and for now there's no plans. Again, here's a list of the videos that I'm currently editing and future videos I plan to film. In the videos being edited category, you can vote for the one that you want me to publish next, and in the future video category, you can vote for the one that you want me to film next. Also, if you're feeling generous, please donate to my Patreon account because with a bigger budget per video, I can do more things. Also, instead of stockpiling videos, I've decided I'm going to publish them as soon as I edit them, so in the next month or so, there's going to be a lot of videos coming out. On my Patreon, I also added a milestone, and if we get to $250 per video, I'll commit to doing videos for at least six months.